Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I think uh, between uh, the songs and uh, the scripture reading, I think I, they summed it all up for me. I, uh, I, I don't have nothing to spot, speak about now. <laughs> I mean, but today I, I want to. Um, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Can we? Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. I got to make sure I stay close. Okay, um, today I'm go- I want to talk a little bit about the correlation between love and the law. Now, there are many, many commandments to talk to us about love. And there's many, many commandments that correlate using the word love. I mean, I just put a few of these down here for you today. Uh, Jimmy, if you could just put the next page. We just see like in, in 1 John 5, 2, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we keep his commandments for this is the love of God. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. And then in John, which we're going to be going through uh, in at Passover, he, he tells us this, John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So, oh, as we look at through all these scriptures today, I want you kind of just, I'm going to have Jimmy keeping them up on the board as we kind of flip through some of them. And I want you to ponder, to, to think about the correlation. Look what it says here in, in Thessalonians. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and please God. And what was the reasoning for all that? That you would abound more and more. And then he talks about in 1 John 2 that how the love of God is perfected. We see that it is perfected through keeping his word. And we see how that brings an intimate relationship. And I want you to think about your physical relationships. I remember in school, as a young lad, I, I really fell hell over, heck over, you know, wheel, uh, heels over some girl, and I would just basically just, you know, want to please her in any which way that, you know, that I could possibly good to get her to like me, you know. And when we think about the correlation, the physical a lot of times shows the spiritual. So maybe that's not the best example to give you, but I want you to think about your physical aspects and what you think is really brings your heart into that, you know, that love atmosphere, that, you know, where you really, really are impacted. You are really, really drawn to it. You are really want to give it your all. So we think about that, and we think about you know things that talk to us about our first love, and uh, we see warnings about keeping our first love. And here we see in Jude, he tells us to keep yourself in the love of God. That's something that we have to do, and he says we do it by looking for the mercy, looking for the mercy of God. And he tells us this is a message that's never changed. It's a message that we've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Just like he told us, just like he showed us, I want you to perceive that. I want you to try to drink that in. Think about how he laid his life down for us. And then think about the example that he tells us, we are to lay our lives down for the brethren. Think how the correlation between that and being born of God, so he speaks, and knowing God, and, and understanding where he's coming from. What kind of heart is he looking for? 
And when we put ourselves up on a scale, think about it. How do we understand if God's really dwelling in us, if that Holy Spirit is really guiding our life? How do, we, how do we do that? How do we know that his love is being perfected in us? Because if his love is being perfected in us, it says we will be bold in that day of judgment. You know, there's a beautiful confidence that comes with you knowing that somebody loves you as much as you love them. And I want you to look at, I mean, think about it. He says, blessed, blessed are those who keep his commandments, that they're going to have the right to the tree of life and enter into that holy city, that beautiful city and a beautiful world where there's no more death, there's no more sting of death, there's no more just anything that's evil. Just a beautiful promise that's laid in store for us, one that Abraham saw, one that Isaac saw, one that Jacob saw. One that David really understood about. You know, David, he loved God so much, he said, how I love thy, thy law. It's my meditation all the day. You know, when you really love something or you really love someone, you can't get them off your mind. I remember that so distinctly when I met my wife. You know, that, you know that's, I just couldn't wait for that time I wanted to see her again, right? And I was putting her first. Like David did with God. He said, I love your commandments above gold. The love of God putting first in our lives. And now these commandments weren't burdensome. They weren't something hard to do. He said, I love your precepts. Quicken me by them. Mold me, shape me. Create in me that heart, Lord. I want to love like you love. I want to love my neighbor as myself. You know, I've gotten to the point, he says, well, I, I hate, I abhor even lying. But I love your law. Because the law was a light unto his path, a lamp unto his feet. And he found great peace in that. He found great peace that gives, God gives to all those who love the law. In fact, God said that, and David said here, that nothing should offend those who really understand the love of God. He said that he loved his t testimonies. He loved God's testimonies exceedingly. So as we look at the heart of David, and we know that David was a man after God's own heart, and we understand things that God says. He says, I love them that love me. Who doesn't love somebody more that really loves them? I mean, it's a natural, it's a natural commitment. He says, those that seek me early shall find me. Don't you want to walk with the Lord forever? He says, I will honor them who honors me. And those that despise me, I will esteem lightly. Wow, so there is a correlation to how close we get to the Lord. And how much we believe in what he's told us. Where he's taking us. What his son has done for us. He says when we set our love upon him, we can count on deliverance. We can count on him setting us up on high. Now, remember how he tells us, don't, you know, don't, when you pray, don't pray for things that, that you know, would benefit you in the world, but, but pray for those things that are above, you know. Don't, don't pray that God makes you rich tomorrow, you know. Pray and seek the kingdom, and then everything else would be added unto you. And we can look at some, some, uh, Great men, some great men in the men of faith in the Bible, we've seen that were blessed immensely, not only spiritually but physically. There's a dozens and dozens of other scriptures here that correlate a unique bond between love and the law. 
So I want to look a little bit at Matthew 22 and 23 today. Because here was a scribe in Matthew 22 and verse 23 that asked Jesus a question. He says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is just like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. And later on, he goes on and explains that everything that happened in those first five books of the Bible, the law, everything that was going on in the prophets, hung on those two commandments. Think about that. Think about how uh, ministers uh, try to say that the old is done away with. Uh, and they try to twist scripture and not saying that I changed not, you're the, I'm the same yesterday and today and forever. In fact, Jesus had stated that I, I, I came not, you know, not one jot, not one tittle would no wise pass from the law. Because the law was a lamp unto all those who were seeking the Lord on how to find him. But see, the Pharisees seemed to get that all messed up. While they were paying rigorous attention to these laws, it became, what, 613 laws according to the Old Testament, Moses? They tried to reason out all the implications of the law and tried to avoid every possibility of violating them without understanding the intent, the intent of the heart. Even God's chastening comes from love. His will is that all would be saved. He's re reiterated this several times in our scriptures. And one I want to go to today is it's found in Micah 6, and in verse 8. Micah 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your Lord. To do justly in business, in dealings with your fellow man, to love mercy, to be easy to forgive, to turn the other cheek, and to walk humbly, subservantly to the Lord. You know, Jesus often reminded the religious people of that time about this godly wisdom because they weren't, they weren't getting it. In fact, he used terms like, go and learn what I mean. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Because Jesus wanted to understand, I'm not coming for the righteous. I'm the doctor. I've come to help sinners to repentance. And he, later on, he chastens them. He chastens people that are supposed to be godly, that are supposed to be walking after him. He said, if you know, knew what it means, here he is chastening it, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the Sadducees. He says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would have not condemned the guiltless. In other words, they weren't, they were walking contrary to what God wanted. They thought they were keeping the commandments strictly. And yet, they were spiritually all messed up. So as we approach the Holy Days, I want to ask you one question. What do you think gets you into the kingdom of heaven? Is it not these two commands? Think about it. Does anybody think they could be like the Pharisees and wash yourself up to your elbows? and that that would make a difference in your salvation? Think about their mindset. As they told the disciples, they were sinning when they ate with unwashed hands. But that David understood. David said, wash me. Wash me with his hop. In faith, we go to the Lord in faith, believing that his blood has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And we say, wash me, make me clean. 
cast my sins far from me. And Lord, here's the, other, here's the second half, I will walk in newness of life. See, because the idea of religion is not really the, the, the Bible, because there are a million different religions, and the only commandment I think they all agree with is uh, tithe. I think you can go to any uh, denomination, and they're not going to deny tithing, but they're going to have all kinds of arguing when it comes to anything else. Now, think about that. They were saying that somebody was sinning because they didn't wash their hands properly. They were creating a, an obedience that was not there. God told them, hey, you forego the word of God when you keep your traditions. Because it wasn't about washing up to the elbow. And it was definitely not something that you should be looking down on others for them not doing it. Now, if you thought it was okay, you thought, hey, I got to wash up to the elbow. That was no sin in that. But when you look down on somebody else for not doing it, not believing that that was true, that's where the issue lied. Because the heart, the heart wasn't for the fellow man. So, like, we have all kinds of little pet doctrines and stuff that are going on. And, like, let's just say for one uh, example, Yahweh, Yahshua. Now, that's all fine by itself. We can call the Lord however we personally connect with him the best. But when we look down on somebody else for not using that, that same terminology, when they address the Lord... We might want to rethink that. We might want to think that. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that Abraham came out of the land of Ur. I don't think he spoke Hebrew at all. I think he spoke Chaldean. But it doesn't matter. It wasn't the language. The language wasn't a matter of salvation. You know what mattered? That he obeyed God's voice. He listened to his instructions. He strove to follow him all the way into the kingdom. It's our heart. It's our innermost thoughts. Wanting to follow the lamb wherever he goes. You know in Luke 6, 45, and I'll give you a second to turn there. Luke 6, 45, it says this. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. You see the biblical conception of loving God? Love doesn't replace the commandments. Love gives us the right motive to do things genuinely. Obey the commandments out of a good heart, out of good will. In, in chapters 22 and 23, we see Jesus make bold statements about the correlation between love and the law. So today we all come here, and I would hope our goal was to be pleasing in God's eyes. And we come and say, Lord, teach us your way. Show off if there's any errors in our understanding. When we look at these Matthew 22, we see that it seemed like a lot of times this understanding was lost. These people were what God said, or Christ said, erring greatly. They were making big mistakes. How did they lose their way? You know what's funny about it is they were really confident that they were right. And they were so bold that they would question the truth. And maybe, and yeah, sometimes even call it a lie. So here we see the scribes trying to verify their assumptions concerning the law and how they applied it. And he, so he gives us this parable in, in, in chapter 22 of Matthew. And it's, a, and it's a parable about going to the wedding. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, telling them which were bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. 
my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all the things are ready, come to the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. The remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and slayed them. Think about that. Here you are, offered the kingdom of God. Come to the wedding. And they didn't put it first. Their hearts weren't right. They thought they were religious, but their hearts weren't right. They would say, we have Abraham as our father, but their hearts weren't right. So, then we, we drop down, we see, well, uh, the servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as would found in both bad and good, so that we know about the wheat and the tares, and the wedding was furnished with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man which did not have on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend. Now, that's an odd thing, right? Hey, friend, what, how did you come here and not hand on a, a wedding garment? Think about that. He was naked before the Lord. And guess what? There was no hiding in the crowd. Jesus knew this man. He could not. Now, we can walk around and we can appear religious to others, but we can end up being naked before the Lord. He asked him, hey, why are you here without the proper attire? Jesus knew the intent of his heart. So we have people here that made light of the author, mistreated people, did not love their neighbor as himself, and yet showed up to the dinner. Think about this parable. If the gospel is the wedding feast, then your wedding garment is your heart. Are you walking a course of life that is agreeable to our profession, the vocation in which we are called? Would your affairs be in order if Christ came? Does our conversation align with the gospel of Christ? See, because it doesn't matter how we look to others. It doesn't matter even if Jesus sees us or hears about us. What only matters is that we're standing fast in the spirit being together in real holiness, real sanctification, looking to the author and finisher of our faith. Our call is to stand fast, stand fast in the spirit, being of one mind, striving together for the faith. Think about it. It's what Christ is what makes us holy what makes us righteous, and how we can show up with a wedding garment that becomes like clean linen, pure and white. So when we think about that, we have to think about our Christian temperament. Do we wear the grace of God like an ornament around our neck? Do we understand the term, by the grace of God, so goes I? Because this man thought he was secure. So Jesus pricks his mind. He kind of questions, what are you doing here in the first place? Because there were going to be many in that day when he separates the wheat and the tares that thought they were part of God's family, that said they loved him, but yet their hearts were not with them. Remember how he says, oh, why haven't we done these many things in your name? And he said, I never knew you. Depart from me the work iniquity. Lawlessness. We're talking about love and the law here. And how they correlate together. And how we serve out of a pure heart. You know, he said this in Psalms 50 and verse 16. Because God wants us to understand our heart. And he wants us to show up with the proper heart. And if we don't, he's going to know about it. And he's going to question us. Just like he said, friend, what are you doing here? In Psalms 50, verse 10, he says to the wicked, right, what right do you have to recite my statutes or take my covenant to your lips? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. 
He says, now check this out, this is all about character. If you see a thief, you are a friend of his. And you keep a company with adulterers. You give your mouth frame to, uh, free reign for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son. Now think about that, how many times has he talked to us about our conduct in Christ and how we treat others? And then he tells us if we love God, we're gonna love our brother as a self. And yet, we'll go along and gossip and talk about that guy or talk about this person. God does not like that. He said, you things, things, things you have done and I've kept silent. You thought I was like one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I ran and there'll be none to deliver. He who brings thanksgiving as his sacrifice honors me to him who orders his way aright. I will show the salvation of God. Who, who, who is it? Who him who orders his way aright. I will show the salvation of God. He called him friend. And yet, like in Isaiah 1.12, he says, when you come before me, who asked you to trample my courts? Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. I want you to think about that. Remember he says if you have, a, if you have, if you come to his altar and you bring in a gift and you got something against your brother, don't bring the offering until you've made it right with your brother. Then come and offer. But here, these Israelites, these people who said we have Abraham as our father, started having tradition just ruin all the all the worship. He said, your new moons, your Sabbath and conversations, I can't bear your worthless assemblies. Think about that. He said what they were doing was now becoming a burden to them. And he was weary, he was getting weary. He didn't even want to see it anymore. In fact he said, you know what? If you don't get this picture, when you pray, I'm gonna hide my eyes from you. Then he tells, I want you to do this. Take your evil deeds out of my sight and stop doing wrong. Learn to do right, seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come on, let's settle the matter, he says. Though your sins are as red as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. What a beautiful blessing. So here when you're walking astray even, and you, you've gotten to the point where he don't even want to hear your prayers, he is still giving you that offer. Come on, let's reason together. Let's reason together. Don't you know that I can wash you and make you clean, make you pure. That, see, that, that was even before Christ. The testimony has been even amplified more by Christ. He says this in James 4.8. If you want to turn to James 4.8, we read this. New Testament scripture. It says this. Do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture said, God's, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So you admit yourselves then to God. Resist, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brother, don't slander against each other. Anyone who speaks against his brother or sister judges them and speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but are sitting in judgment. See the difference? You're sitting in judgment. You all of a sudden became the, the judge. So how is that loving your brother? Where's your heart? Do you see that? 
We have so many testimonies in the scripture of religious people whose heart really wasn't light, right. They became the law givers. But there's only one law giver. There's only one judge. There's only one who's able to save and able to destroy. So he questions us. Why are you judging your neighbor? You know, he gives us all these parables because he wants us to ponder. And he wants us to choose sound wisdom. He wants us to come to the knowledge of the truth. But guess what? We could always harden our heart. We can always refuse. I mean, look at these people weren't looking at an important event on their calendar. They didn't count the cost. They didn't see the loss that would come from the poor decision. They rejected the Lord. They followed their own path. You know, Jesus said in Revelation, I know your works. I know your labor and your patience. He knows how we apply his wisdom in our lives. He knows how we judge others. He knows if we're using the same measure that we want for ourselves. And he really wants us, he tells us time and time again, our character matters. And we have to seek him, we have to come to a sanctuary. He'll sh and say, Lord, like David did, a man after God's own heart, show me my hidden faults. Show me my shortcomings. Lord, mold me, shape me, create in me a heart. Because this teaching goes as follows. A man apart from grace, a man apart from faith, well, the law doesn't work eternal life for him. The promise is to those who walk by faith and those who understood that it was Jesus, that he was the guarantor of a better covenant. He was the only way to be saved completely. He was our intercessor. We could walk into the Holy of Holies. And he could be our intercessors. We seem that we could fool ourselves, but we can never fool Jesus. He knows our every thought. He judges them whether they're good or evil, and he even tells us our conscience will be, bear witness in the day of judgment, whether we will be excused or accused. So while we might fool others with our outward appearance, we're not gonna fool him. While we may fool ourselves, our conscience in the end will bear witness. You know, the law did not profit them. Why? Because it wasn't a light to their path. It wasn't a lamp unto their feet. And it was not coupled with faith. In other words, they didn't trust the way, the truth, and the life. And yet, God said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John 14, 21, he said this, he that has my commandments and keep them, it is he that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. He that does not love me, he has not kept my sayings. And the word which you heard is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So that, that's a kick right on religion's uh, uh, face, if you want to say, right off the air. Because they try to say, oh, well, God's the mean old God of the Old Testament, and Jesus is, is, is uh, this little baby in the New Testament, or however you want to say. He says that everything that he spoke was his Father's. It came from far, his Father. Now, we've just seen a few of the examples of the hundreds of times. We, if you get your Bible up, and just look up love. Get, get a strong concordance. Look up love. And if you want to get a good concept of love, just read all the places where it talks about love. If you want to really understand the law, do the same thing. And then take them both together and read them both from the love of God. Because there's a great correlation now, some people, they wonder, what laws, what ordinance, what statutes do I have to do? 
I want you to tell you those ten commandments are summed up in those two commandments. The first five, the last five, summed up beautifully. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, but there was a lot of woes going on. Woes to those religious people who were teaching wrong. They weren't practicing what they were preaching. They were putting heavy burdens on people. And God called them hypocrites. In other words, he said everything they were doing was for show. Think about that. We that teach another, he says, you that teach another, don't you teach yourself? He, he calls us, wants us to think. He wants us to ponder, but it's for our benefit. He, you know, we can take the law two different ways. We can take it as something burdensome that's bent us down, or we can take it as something that's lifting us up, that's guiding us, that's leading us to a deeper and greater love. But think about it. When it becomes a heavy burden, a huge weight, instead of the love of God, I don't believe your heart's going to really want to do it. And that's what these men were doing. They were lay, making it a huge weight. They were laying on the shoulders. You know, it's hard to live from a loving heart. And that's the difference between religion and true worship. When man corrupts the word through human reasoning or philosophy, it's no longer the truth, it, and it's no longer spiritual. It becomes earthly and devilish. And if you go through your Bible and just watch how he relates to the Pharisees, Pharisees, Pharisees and scribes, you're going to see it. You're going to see what he doesn't want, and then you're going to see what he wants. You know, on the Sermon on the Mount, he gave us the true intent of the law. True worshipers were going to be blessed, weren't they? Blessed are they. Blessed are they. Blessed are they, he said. You see, religion emphasizes the letter of the law, and it completely misses the message. That's why he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against man, and you neither go there yourselves, neither suffer them that are entering in to go. And Jesus, Jesus called them out, and in John 10.10 10, he says this, a thief comes in only to steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So who are we looking to? Who's the author and finisher of our faith? I mean, because when we say I'm a Peter, I'm a Paul, I'm of this, I'm of that, we've gone wrong. In fact, he was saying that people's eyes were, were shut. He said they were blind guides. They were leaders of the blind. Because they omitted the weightier matters of the law, which was what? Judgment, mercy, and faith. Judgment, mercy, and faith. He told them that they made the word of God worthless. Think about it. Our decisions have to be God-breathed, have to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because when we are left to our own devices, it usually doesn't turn out well. And you could see that these men here were so in danger of losing everything, not receiving the kingdom, he, that he asked them this question. He said to you, how, do you, how are you going to plan on escaping the damnation of hell? Christ asked them that. Now think about it. He knows our hearts. He knows we can't fool him. We can look like we're beautifully religious to our, our neighbors. We can show up at the wedding feast. But he's going to know. I want you to ponder the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to spend some time as we approach these holy days understanding why the people were blessed. 
and, and, and going in prayer and asking the Lord to show you if there's any wicked way in you. And say, Lord, help me follow your path. Help me not turn to my own way. Help me make the law my love and love the law. Give me the faith that I can see things as David did. That I can receive the good news as the men of faith did. Not as those who heard the word and rejected it and it did not end up benefiting them. You know what? How it benefits us? When we're united. When we're like one. We're united in faith, he says. Think about all the men that walked in faith. Ponder that as we reach these holy days. Then think about those he said, don't show up before me and be handed. Don't bear your talent. Don't come up to me without any profitability. Do not take what I've given you and make it like something you buried. He went up on that mount and God wrote with his finger instructions and righteousness. And Jesus was just summing them up. And he tells us, you can come up to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, to a number of amount of angels. Come, come, bring all your cares before me. Bring your requests before the Lord. He's calling us to his holy mountain. And the holy mountain that he offers us in the end comes from love. And we follow the Lord, the Lamb, wherever he goes because of love. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, the sting of death is sin. But the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he calls this, and I think that maybe Lois might have read this. Huh? Therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for so much as you know that your labor is not in vain with the Lord. Having these promises, it says in 1 Corinthians, all these promises that are being offered to you. Then he tells us, cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and perfecting your holiness in the fear of the Lord. Peter put it this way in 2 Peter 4, verse 1. 2 Peter 4, verse 1. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. My boy says, this corruption, corruptible, shall put on incorruption. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, patience, and, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charities. Now check this out. For if these things be in you, and abound in you, they make you that you shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does he mean when he says, if you love me, keep my commandments? Well, we read it's the Father's word that the Christ speaks. And it's the Father's will that he performs. He speaks on all authority, power, but with all mercy and love. And he says, real belief leads us to love out of a pure heart. I want you to think, ponder about it this next couple of weeks on how intimate a relationship that is. If we walk after Jesus, he gives us everything we want. We can bring all of our cares to him. This intimacy, see the intimacy has both sides feeding off each other. It's love in a nutshell. Follow his Christian character, we end up loving God. Obedience equals favor. Favor produces favor. 
and our cup overfloweth. So I want you to understand that the great promise is found in our dependency on Christ. We long for direction, we long for guidance, and Christ longs to give us our heart's desire. What was Abraham's desire? What was David's desire? What did all the other people of faith desire? Was it not a kingdom? Was it not perfection of the soul? Was it only things that God could give? He, God asks, have you not read which was spoken to you by God? Because what was spoken to God was written for our learning. And he wanted us to understand and believe and follow in faith. Because without that, we were going to be men most miserable. He doesn't want us to lose our way. But he wants us to have hope. And not only does he want us to have hope, he wants us to be assured in that hope. He wants us to be, have that much of an intimate relationship with him. Think about it. Think about how two-sided, think about the physical aspects. Think about the person that you love the most. You know, and, and I remember, we're not perfect beings, but just think about the person that you love the most, whether it's a little child, whether it's your spouse, you know, whether it was your first love. Think about how you hurt, wanted to do what was good and just and right. And then take that to the higher level. Take that to the spiritual level. We just in thinking about all the blessings that are going to come to you. All the peace of mind. The your walk's going to be clear. You're not going to stumble to the left or to the right. You're going to know. Each step is going to be secured by the blood of the Lamb. So as we approach these holy days, I want you to understand that the law was for our benefit, and it was out of love that the Lord gave it to us. Thank you.